one of his tales of the bizarre. That'll be along in just a sec. And then after that, we'll be whisking you off to Earthsea for another episode of Ursula Le Guin's fantasy saga. So let's all take a good deep breath and jump into the dimension. Now, if I know you, and I think I do by now, we're friends, right? I know you are not a fan of further ado. So I could sit here telling you all about the wonderful, bizarre tale Ray Bradbury has in store for us this evening, but why would I do that when Ray is right here to tell you himself? So, without further ado, Ray, it's over to you. Our next tale is The Fruit at the Bottom of the Bowl. Now, this is one of those cases where uh, word association helped me, but also I got to uh, thinking about fingerprints. I think we're all fascinated by that. And uh, we look into the background of the police over a period of many years and the identification of, of criminals by their fingerprints, and we're fascinated with it. And then you begin to think to yourself, well, what if by some strange, terrible accident I became involved in a, a murder of some sort? And I'd been in a room with someone and left my fingerprints all over the place. Uh, what would I polish off first? What would I clean? How would I get rid of the fingerprints? Uh, do I stop at a certain point? Well, once that idea seized me, it became irresistible because there is no stopping point for a compulsive and passionate and panicked individual. So again, I sat down. I set up the situation. I brought the people into juxtaposition. And I put the fingerprints all over the place to see what would happen to them. So here now you have fruit at the bottom of the bowl, and I'd like to have you pay a special attention to the performer, Nigel Anthony, who will be playing one of the leads because he plays against himself. He plays against his alter ego, Acton. So I think it's a very special thing to listen for. And here it is, fruit at the bottom of the bowl. <laughs> <coughs> Done? Is it? Are you sure? Check. Check, he's dead. Yes. Right. Now what? Well, leave, of course. Go, get out of here. Now, wait, wait, wait. Listen. Did anyone hear? No. Nothing. <laughs> No banging on the door, no shouting voices, nothing. Done, and nobody knows. <laughs> Clock. Midnight. I did it. I didn't know for sure that I was going to do it. I didn't know for sure that I could do it. <laughs> but I have, I have done a murder. <laughs> Is that all you can say about it? What? Rather prosaic, surely, for William Acton, the writer. Isn't it enough that I did it? It's just that I'd have thought you could do better than done a murder. I expected something like... William Acton had never thought of himself as a sculptor, and yet in this moment, looking down between his hands at the body upon the polished hardwood floor, he realized that by some sculptural clenching and remodeling and twisting of human clay... He had taken hold of this man named Donald Huxley and changed his physiognomy, the very frame of his body. For Christ's sake, I've just committed a murder. Committed? I don't like that. What about accomplished? William Acton's fingers had stroked typewriter keys and made love and fried ham and eggs for early breakfasts. Nice everyday touch, that. And now those same ten whorled fingers had accomplished a murder. That's true. With a twist of my fingers, I wipe the supercilious glitter, the Huxley look from those piercing gray eyes. Much better, Acton. Well, go on, don't stop. Notice his lips. Remember how pink and sensuous they were? Gaping wide, equine teeth, yellow incisors, nicotine canines, gold inlaid molars. His nose, ears. Mottled, pale, discolored. His hands. Open, pleading, for the first time in their lives, instead of demanding... It could be said that death has made him a handsomer man to deal with. You can talk to him now. I could talk to him now, and he'd have to listen. And he couldn't answer back. Here's a thought, Acton. His hands, open, 
pleading, as you put it, as a result of the work of your hands. My own two hands. Look at them. What about them? Ordinary hands. Oh, now you come to mention that I suppose they are. They're not thick, not thin, not long, not short, not hairy, not naked, not manicured, and yet not dirty, not soft, and yet not callous, not wrinkled, and yet not smooth. Yes, ordinary hands. Not murdering hands at all. So why are you staring at them in that way? What's in them of such immense interest that you should pause now, after successfully accomplishing a murder, and examine them wall by wall? It's not the hands as hands, or the fingers as fingers. What then? It's the tips of the fingers. The parts that leave the prints, you mean? They gripped Huxley's neck, left their traces, telltale marks, as clear as if I'd left a signed confession on the floor beside him. There's a handkerchief in Huxley's pocket. Use it. You mean? Get rid of the fingerprints. Wipe the throat? Methodically. Yes. Swab it, rub it clean. Yes. And the back of the neck. Did my fingers reach the back of his neck? Can you be sure they didn't? I'll do it. Better safe than sorry. Yes, but... But what? Did I only touch his throat? How can I be sure? What if I happened to have touched the rest of his face by accident without even remembering that I'd done it? Better clean the face. A quick wipe over won't hurt. Cheeks, chin, lips, nose, ears, eyes, forehead. That's right. There. What about the floor? What about it? Didn't you touch it? When? Just then. No, did I? I thought so. Just with the fingertips steadying yourself, you know? I can't see anything. <laughs> you wouldn't, would you? I suppose not. But they will. They? Whoever finds him, whoever investigates his murder. Yes, murder. Perhaps a quick wipe. Where, where do I start? Near the head. It would have been near the head, definitely. A bit of a rub then, here and here, near the head. In fact, all around the head, so maybe... What? Maybe wipe around the rest of the body. Why? What for? Just thinking. When he fell, when Huxley fell, you stumbled slightly. Put your hand out. Did I? Might easily have done. Reflex action, nothing more. Then, when you were checking that he really was dead, you took his wrist to feel his pulse. You really ought to wipe that wrist while you're about it. Good. Now, when you lifted his wrist, perhaps your fingers, your fingertips, brushed the floorboards, left a smudge somewhere on the varnish. Swap the floor, then. Swap around the body. A nicer word would be polish. Think of it as giving the floor a bit of a polish. Putting a shine on things, if you like. Yeah, polish. How far out are you planning to polish? What do you mean? The distance from the body, I suppose I should say the corpse. Um, one yard? Yes, that looks about a yard. A yard on all sides? Yes, that should be enough. Well, maybe two would be better. Two yards. Two yards on all sides. Yes, that would be better. You sound unsure. What do you think? Three yards? On all sides. Yes, three yards on all sides. <laughs> Why have you stopped? It's a house. The whole house, the entire place. It's all surfaces. Mirrors, veneers, marble, metal and glass, painted on polished wood, all waiting to be caressed, touched, finger marked. Keep calm. Retrace your steps. Go over the events, conversation, everything that happened from the moment you rang the doorbell. Oh, come on, come on. Oh, it's you, actor. Where's my wife, Huxley? Do you think I'd tell you, really? Huxley? Don't stand out there, you idiot. If you want to talk business, come in. Very well, then. Over there, through that door, into the library. After you. There. That was your first mistake. Now the doorbell was your first mistake. This was your second mistake. You touched the doorknob on the library door. Maybe you touched some other part of the door. You want a drink? I need one. I can't believe Lily is gone. There's a decanter of Burgundy Act and 59 Vintage. A rich wine exclusively for the rich. I bought a dozen bottles recently in auction. Mind fetching it? Yes, fetch it. Handle it. Touch it. And you did. You'll find the glasses on the shelf below. 
The cabinet, the decanter, the shelf, the glasses. Pour one for me too, will you? I'm glad you came around today. Tomorrow you'd have missed me. I'm off to Mexico City with uh, some friends. Frightfully early start. They're collecting me at six. Six o'clock. God knows why we have to take the first flight. Anyway, here we are. Uh, thanks, Acton. Cheers. Forgive me if I don't drink your health. While you're here, you might care to look at one or two of those books. There are some interesting first editions. I didn't come to look at books. I know, I but you must just indulge me and look at that little book with the green Morocco binding right up your street. It'll only take a second. Pick it up. Touch it. Feel the binding. The Adventures of the Guilford Jackdaw. Early English. Ever seen it? Interspersed with anecdotes of some little good and bad boy. Fascinating, isn't it? How old would you say? 18th century? 1790-something. Very good, Acton. Christie's dated it as circa 1795. <laughs> Interesting moral text. Turn the pages. Run your fingers over them. Is it not amazing that though a murder had been committed in this place so many years since, and the man was hanged at the market house in the town. That book, it was about a murder. There, there was a picture, an old engraving, of the murder swinging from the gibbet. That book? Yes. You touched it? Yes. Books, decanter, and glasses. Well, in a word, fingerprints. Fingerprints? Oh, my God, they must be everywhere, everywhere. Gloves. That's what you needed. An initial error, not wearing gloves for a murder. But I hadn't planned to do a murder. Maybe not. But what you need now is a pair of gloves before you go any further. Where? The hall. The coat rack. Wait. What? The doorknob. Use the handkerchief to open it. Right. And while you're there, wipe the doorknob clean on both sides of the door. Right. And perhaps the door itself. The whole door, since you're there. Right. Now, what was I looking for out here? Gloves. Coat rack. Huxley's overcoat. Yeah. yeah. Oh, nothing in the pockets. No gloves? No. Well, somewhere in the house there must be at least one pair of gloves. Hurry. No, don't hurry. Don't do anything frantic. Nothing wild. You've got until six in the morning at the outside when Huxley's friends come to pick him up for the trip to the airport. Six hours? A little less, more or less. Say five. Better still four. Four and a half at the outside. I don't need four and a half hours. Of course not. Now carefully, calmly, upstairs, and look for a pair of gloves. <sighs> nothing. Still nothing. Another damn drawer and no gloves. <sighs> How many drawers have I gone through? Must be 60, 70. More like 80. Probably 82. <sighs> no gloves in here. Eighty-two drawers in six rooms, all left with their tongues, so to speak, hanging out. <laughs> uh. Oh, there! Oh, at last! Found them! Gloves! At the bottom of the eighty-third drawer. Oh, my lord, my lord! Oh. Well, put them on, then. Put them on and button them up. Do they fit? Oh, yes, yes. They're gray, like doves, two doves. How do they feel? Soft, thick, impregnable. Well done, Acton. You can do all sorts of tricks now and leave no marks. But where do I start? I think they call it the scene of the crime. He's still there. He's dead. On the floor. Actually fell to the floor on purpose. What a wickedly clever man. How do you mean? Down under the hardwood floor dropped Huxley with you after him. Rolling, tussling, clawing at the floor, printing and printing it with your fingertips. Huxley slipped away a few feet. I crawled after him, laid my hands on his neck. Squeezed until the life came out like paste from a tube. Yes, but the floor. Yes. It will have to be cleaned, won't it? Every wildly infested inch. Inch by inch? Just to be on the safe side. Inch by inch. See your face in it. That's nice. That's clean. That's good. I've reached the table. What about the table? It's mahogany, Acton. German breakfast table from the mid-nineteenth century. I had the veneer restored. Superb job. Surface like glass. Oh, look underneath. It's got that typical central support with scroll cards. Damn your table, Huxley! What about the surface, the tabletop? A quick wipe. But the bowl. Surely not the bowl. 
Menton Majolica, 1877 or thereabouts. Very unusual. The scallop shell supported by mermen handles. Look at the richness of the color, the green and coral pink of the garlands around the necks of the mermen. The delicacy of the glaze. There seem to be some smudges on the glaze. Look like fingerprints. But not the fruit. Wax fruit, easily marked. Well, just a few at the top, then. The apple, orange, and pear. No need to do the grapes. No need to do the fruit at the bottom of the bowl. What about the mirror hanging over the table? Why, well, I'm certain I didn't touch that. Then why are you staring at it? I'm thinking. About what? About doors. Which doors? That's the whole point. I don't know. I can't remember which doors I've used tonight. Better polish all of them, then. Except the one I've already cleaned. Which one was that? That one. What was it? Th Better polish all of them, then. Yes. Polish them thoroughly. The doorknobs, keyhole covers, and finger plates. Mustn't leave any fingerprints on the finger plates. Polish the door panels, the tops, the edges. And what about the furniture? You certainly sat. I remember you sitting, but where? I'll wipe all the arms. Just the arms? Yes, why? I was just remembering. That chair you're sitting in, Acton, is one of a set of Louis Say's gilded beechwood fauteuil by P.F. Francois Joseph Corbusier, worth about $15,000 a piece. The floral silk covering is original. Just feel that material. So cunning. Feel that material. I didn't come here to talk furniture, Huxley. I came about Lily. Oh, come off it. You're not that serious about it. I... She doesn't love you, you know. Oh, she... You told me she'd go with me to Mexico City tomorrow. You and your money and your damn furniture. <laughs> but it's nice furniture, Acton. Be a good guest, Acton. Feel it. Touch it. No! Fingerprints can't be found on fabric. Can they? Not sure. Maybe they'll be best of you. All right, all right. Did you guess, Huxley? Did you guess I was going to kill you? Or maybe his subconscious suspected, just as your subconscious suspected. Maybe his subconscious told him to make you run about the house, handling, touching, and fondling. Were you that clever, Huxley? That mean? Where are you going now? The table. You polish the table. The bowl, the fruit bowl. You polish the bowl. The fruit. You polish the fruit. Not the fruit at the bottom of the bowl. Better... Just a wipe. And the wall. And what about the wall? Oh, no, no, that's silly. Clean the wall, you mean? Well, it's just this sudden memory of your struggling with Huxley, him fending you off, giving you a shove. Do you remember him shoving you? Yes. Do you remember falling, getting up, touching the wall? Quite where now, I'm not sure. Then running at Huxley again? Then I strangled him, then he died. Yes, but the wall. No, that's ridiculous. I've done this room. I'll do the next room. I must be methodical. Altogether, we were in the hall, the library, this room, the dining room, and the kitchen. What's that? What? I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye. On the wall, you mean? It was nothing. You mean that spot on the wall behind you? There is no spot on the wall. Isn't there? All right, all right. Just to be sure. Uh, see? Now, what spot? I, I can't see any spot. There, just there. Oh, a little one. Yes, right, there. Well, what are you waiting for? Get rid of it. It, it isn't a fingerprint, anyhow. Well, that one may not be. Well, I can't see any others. Not there. No, no, further up. Just there, to the right a bit. Could that be one? Well, why are you there just staring like that? I was thinking, thinking about the way the, the wall goes over to the right and over to the left and down to my feet and up over my head. Yes. No, that would be too much. How many square feet? I don't give a good damn. But you're starting to clean it all the same, I see. Polishing to left and right, up and down, inch by inch. I can't do this. I must do the other rooms. Polish the essentials. <gasps> Christ. What can I do? Nothing. Ignore it. Go away. Huxley, you're in there. I heard you moving about, talking, breathing. I know you're in there. <laughs> yes, I'm in here. Yes. Ah, hell. Hell. He's gone. Yes, but I've got to hurry. I've got to hurry. Time, time. Only a few hours before those damn fool friends blunder in. 
But the wall, this wall is flawless. This wall may be, but the other three, the three is yet unpolished. Those walls are all right. I won't touch them. Must be thorough. Polish and swab up and down. Every stroke must overlap along the skirting board, around the light switch. While you're there, clean the light switch. On and off. Now down the sides of the door, into the corner. Nowhere left for finger marks to lurk. What's the time? 3.13. Now the next wall. Why have you stopped? What have you seen? What are you thinking? The bowl. You polish the bowl. But the fruit, the fruit at the bottom of the bowl. Then I must do that mirror that keeps catching the light and reflecting little marks. You polish the mirror. It catches the light from the chandelier. Fearful extravagance, of course, having a chandelier. Brought it back from Paris. I was there last year. With Lily, in case you hadn't guessed. Eighteen thousand dollars. Can't remember what that was in francs. It's in what they call the Louis Quinze manner, somewhere towards the end of the 1800s. One hundred and fifty glass drops. Needless to say, it's scarcely ever cleaned. One hundred and fifty drops of rainbow glass. I'll get a chair. That's it. One of those. Louis says gilded beechwood, wasn't it? Climb up and... What? No! How could I have touched the chandelier? It's Huxley and his damned antiques trapping me, catching me out, making me do crazy things. You're getting down. You're not going to clean the chandelier? No! I'm not going to clean the chandelier. And as for this... Louis says gilded beechwood chair... <coughs> You've hit one of the walls you've yet to clean. Damn the walls! There's still the dining room. What's in the dining room? You've seen my collection of plates and dishes, haven't you, Acton? Several new items of which I'm particularly proud. The Clarice Cliff pieces are new. Picked them up in London last fall. I love the Honolulu plate with all those twisted trees and bubbly foliage. Fabulous color, so primitive, straight out of a child's paint box. And... Here's a lovely bit of ceramics by Gertrude and Otto Netzler. It is lovely, yes. Isn't it? Pick it up. Turn it over. See the fine thinness of the bowl hand-thrown on a wheel. Thin as eggshell. Incredible. And the amazing volcanic glaze. Don't be afraid. Handle it. Go ahead. I don't mind. Shall I tell you where I got it? Actually... It was a New Year's present from Lily. <gasps> Careful, don't drop it, Acton. Handle it, go ahead, pick it up, that's what he said. What he didn't say was, put your fingerprints all over it, Acton, leave irrefutable evidence that you were here, picking up, handling, touching. And who gave him the damn bowl? She did damn her, too! What have you done? I'm fool, 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 fool! Find the pieces, all of them, idiot. Every shard and chip and fragment, gather it all together, none of it must be left behind. What do I do with them? Polish them, of course. Each piece, each irregular little ceramic atom must be polished as if it were a precious stone. What a fool I am! Over there, another piece under the chair, glimmering in the dark, waiting to be found, waiting to reveal its secret marks. Get it! Polish it! What about the time? 3.30. You must work harder. Get your jacket off and get down to it. So much to do. So many surfaces to rub and wipe and swab. So much that needs to be cleaned and polished in this room alone. Walls and floors. Tables and chairs. Drawers full of linen. Window panes and ledges. Drapes and curtain rods. Doors and doorknobs. Plates and blocks. I want to show you my house, Hector. In the kitchen, utensils in satin sheen, stainless steel. Mixing bowls, saucepans, pots and containers. Refrigerator, freezer and dishwasher. Mixer, blenders, stove and sink unit. Cupboard doors, work surfaces, marble chopping boards. Every sparkling glass, every inch of glittering chromium. You must let me show you around. In the library, books and maps and portfolios of prints. Hundreds of names on leather spines that may have been brushed or caressed. Melville, Cervantes, Whitman and Yeats, Mark Twain and Lewis Carroll, Freud, Wittgenstein and Kant. A signed photograph of Abe Lincoln, a bronze inkstand and a goose quill pen. And an ivory skull. Follow me. I'll lead the way. The Room of the Murder. The room full of all those things that I may have accidentally touched leaving tiny, tiny little whorls no bigger than than your finger. Leaving traces over the mirror, the table, the fruit bowl. The fruit? The fruit at the bottom of the bowl. I so much want you to enjoy being in my house. So much to be cleaned, re-cleaned, polished and repolished. The body, the floor, 
table, mirror, walls, doors, windows, ceiling, chandelier, every drop of glass, every shimmering pendant of hanging fire. Wash the body, wipe all his clothes, polish his shoes, and polish the fruit at the bottom of the bowl. 428, 12 rooms downstairs, 8 above, 100 chairs, 6 sofas, 27 tables, 6 radios, and under and on top and behind, the banister leading upstairs. Leave one little print, and it will reproduce and make a million more. And then the job will have to be done all over again. 513, arms aching, eyes swollen, hardly able to move, but must keep moving. Swabbing and rubbing, swabbing and rubbing. Bedroom by bedroom, closet by closet, the house is polished to a brilliance, vases shine, chairs are burnished to a glow, bronzes, brasses, and coppers are a glint, floors sparkle, banisters gleam, 541, on and up again, the attic. The attic. All trunks, all frames, all chairs, all toys, all music boxes. What's that? Chipped teapots, cracked mirrors. Listen. Tarnish cutlery, threadbare suits. Someone's coming, Acton. A rocking horse that no longer rocks. Footsteps. A dusty collection of Civil War coins. William Acton. Who's that? Ask him what he wants. What do you want? Are you William Acton? What does he want to know for? Yes. Your jacket was downstairs near the body. Body? Don't panic. Don't say anything. The body of Donald Huxley, the occupant of this house. Did you know the deceased? You don't have to answer. I'm a police officer, Acton. Did you know Donald Huxley? Why, yes. Fool! I'm taking you down the precinct, Acton. He can't pin a thing on you. You can't pin a thing on me. You won't find any fingerprints. You hear? Not so much as a single mark. Well, we may not need any fingerprints. What's he talking about? Why not? Fingerprints are only necessary where we have to look for a murderer. Come along, Acton. No sudden moves, Acton. Down the steps into the car. Hold on. You can't leave it like that. Leave it like what? What are you saying, Acton? Don't you see it? Yes, of course. We'll ask him to give you a moment, just a few seconds. Officer. Hmm? Uh, one moment, please. What for? Tell him. Before you close the door, there's something I have to do. I don't want any funny business. Officer, do you have a handkerchief I could borrow? What? Well, I guess so. Here. Do it well. For God's sake, make a good job of it. I just have to wipe the doorbell. And the doorknob. There. Done. Acton was played by Nigel Anthony, Huxley by John Hartley, and the police officer by Roger May. The story was called The Fruit at the Bottom of the Bowl, and it was dramatized by Brian Sibley. Martin Jenkins directed the play in London, my name is Ray Bradbury, and I wrote the original story. I hope you'll be able to join us next week when the next of my Tales of the Bazaar is a story of grief, technology, and hope, and it is called I Sing the Body Electric. And yes, as if this place couldn't get any weirder, Ray will have an electric grandmother for you right here in the dimension at the same time next week. The Seventh Dimension.